Thank you. Y'all may be seated if you like. Uh, <clears throat> when we go to the Lord in prayer this morning, there may be people here that has a special need. You'd like to raise your hand for us to remember in prayer. I believe a lot of us have a special need. God wants to meet our needs here. And that's why we come to worship and to praise him. And this morning we want to keep our hearts open to, as Nathan ministers to us, the word of God. And, and Lord, when we keep our hearts open, God will begin to minister to us and through us because it's his word. It's his word, not Nathan's word, but it's God's word that he will be sharing with us today. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for this day that you've given us. I thank you for this time, Lord, that we can come and pray for one another, Lord, and we see the hands that went up, the needs. We all probably have needs, Lord. And Father, I ask right now in the name of Jesus, Father, that you would meet every need that's here today. Father, that you would just reach down some way, somehow, Lord, whether it be sickness, Lord, or would be something maybe that's interfering with us worshiping you, Lord. I just pray in the name of Jesus, Lord, that you would minister healing in their bodies, their mind, and their soul. And, Father, we're going to give you the praise and the honor. And we ask, Lord, for the anointing today upon your service, upon this service in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you, Brother Dwight. Good morning again. Hey, God is still good. Amen. Amen. I just want to welcome you again this morning. And I want to say to each of you, welcome home. You belong at Cross Point. At Cross Point, we are pursuing God, we're growing in faith, we're discovering our purpose, and we're transforming lives by the power of the Holy Spirit at work in us. Amen? Well, if you missed last week, we talked about breaking chains of the past. We delved into how our past sins, failures, and regrets can act like chains binding us, weighing us down from moving forward and what God has for us. But the good news is, is through Jesus, freedom is not a possibility, but it's a promise. We explored the frustrating cycles of repeating the same mistakes despite our best intentions, the efforts to change that seem to fall short, and the feeling of being stuck in patterns that keep us from moving forward. These burdens can significantly impact our emotional, our spiritual, and relational well-being. But the heart of our message was the transformative power of Jesus Christ to break these chains, offering forgiveness, healing, and redemption. Because Jesus' mission is to proclaim the good news, set captives free, and declare the year of the Lord's favor. That's what he told us. And so when we lay down our burdens at the foot of the cross, each link in the chain is broken by his love, leading us into a life marked by freedom and grace. Well, today, as you probably noticed, is Palm Sunday. We're all waving around these palms. Uh, and next week is Easter already, can you believe that? Easter in March this year. But today we are in the second week of our three-week series called Breaking Chains, Freedom in Christ. Part two today is the price of freedom, the price of freedom. Today we're going to talk about the sacrifice of Jesus and just what that means for us. I don't know if you've ever been in a situation where you feel financially stuck and you just don't know what to do. Maybe your vehicle has broken down for the first time or the fifth time, uh, or there was a big water leak at your house. Yeah, we've had one or two of those. Or maybe even something where the cost was just so great that you needed help paying for it, right? Because everything comes with a price, doesn't it? Well, I wanna ask you this morning, have you ever considered the true cost of your freedom in Christ? I mean, have you ever truly counted the real cost, thought about it, dwelt on it. What is the cost of our freedom? 
Well, to do that, what we first have to understand is that God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Amen? He hasn't changed. And you may remember that in the Old Testament, there was something that we call the sacrificial system of worship. What was that? Well, it was established through the law of Moses, and it's all types of sacrifices that were required for different things. They were carried out at the tabernacle in the desert and later at the temple in Jerusalem. And each type of sacrifice had a specific purpose, ranging from atonement for sins to expressions of thanksgiving and devotion. There were six main types of sacrifices. The first was the burnt offering. This was a voluntary sacrifice that signified the total surrender of the person to God. It was completely burnt on the altar with no part eaten by anyone. It symbolized atonement for unintentional sin in general, and it represented submission to God's will. The second was the grain offering. It's also a voluntary act of worship. This offering consisted of fine flour, olive oil, and frankincense, with a portion burnt on the altar and the rest given to the priests. And it represented recognition of God's provision, and it was an expression of thanksgiving and devotion. The third was the peace offering. Now, this voluntary sacrifice expressed fellowship and thanksgiving to God. That's a lot of offerings, right? It involved a communal meal eaten by the offerer, their family, and the priests, all together. And it symbolized peace and reconciliation with God. The fourth was the sin offering. Uh Uh-oh. This mandatory offering, mandatory, was made for specific unintentional sins. And it provided atonement for the individual or community, depending on the nature of the sin. The offering varied according to the person's status with different requirements for priests, the community, leaders, and laypersons. The fifth was the guilt offering. Similar to the sin offering, the guilt offering was required in cases of unintentional sin, particularly those involving sacred things or property rights. It signified restitution and atonement for the offense. And the sixth offering that we're going to talk about today is the drink offering. This offering accompanied burnt and grain offerings and consisted of wine poured on the altar. It symbolized joy and gratitude towards God. These sacrifices were the only means, the only means for the Israelites to maintain a right relationship with God, for them to seek forgiveness for their sins and express their devotion and thanksgiving. Even now, I don't know if you've heard this, there are preparations being made in Jerusalem to sacrifice a red heifer for Passover outside of the Temple Mount for the first time in 2,000 years since the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem in A.D. 7. Now, you may be surprised to find out that in the New Testament, there is still a system. It's still a sacrificial system. A sacrifice is still required. Some of us maybe think that that's changed somehow that there are no more sacrifices today at the temple. I know what you're thinking. I've been at church, I don't know, a few times, maybe hundreds of times, maybe my whole life. And I know I've never seen a full-blown sacrifice up there at the altar at church. I've never seen anything like that. And you're right, we've never done that. You see, the requirement hasn't changed because God hasn't changed. But how can this be? How is that the requirement? We don't do that. It's because the sacrifice has already been made. Can I get an amen? The sacrifice 
has already been made. Hallelujah. There is still a sacrifice required for everything that we've done. But this sacrifice is so powerful that we only need the one sacrifice. And it's for all people and for all time. Romans 6.10 tells us, the death he died, Jesus died. He died to sin once for all. One time for all people. You see, the sacrificial system had always pointed forward to the ultimate sacrifice of Jesus Christ. And his sacrifice fulfilled and superseded all the other sacrifices. And what Jesus did, there's a prophecy for that. It was even predicted 700 years before Jesus was born. And this prophecy was connected to Jesus in three of the Gospels, in Matthew, Luke, and John, and it was also cited in two of the letters, 1 Peter and Romans in the New Testament. And in the book of Isaiah, chapter 53, we read the word of the Lord through the prophets. Probably heard this a few times. Who has believed our message? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up before him like a tender shoot and like a root out of dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him. Nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering and familiar with pain like one from whom people hide their faces. He was despised, and we held him in low esteem. Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering. Yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions, and he was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds, we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before its shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment, he was taken away. Yet who of his generation protested? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgression of my people, he was punished, and he was assigned a grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death though he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. And though the Lord makes his life an offering for sin, he will see his offspring and prolong his days, and the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. And he has suffered after he has suffered. He will see the light of life, and he will be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant will justify many. That means by the knowledge of him. And he will bear their iniquities, their sin. Therefore, I will give him a portion among the great, and he will divide the spoils with the strong, because he poured out his life unto death and was numbered with the transgressors. For he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. What we have to understand is that a sacrifice is necessary for forgiveness to cover sins. That doesn't change. But why did it have to be this way? Why did it have to be like this? I want you to think about a ledger, like a checkbook. 
It holds all your life's transactions. You're holding it. And on one side, there's everything that we've ever done wrong, every mistake, every hurt we've caused, every time we've turned away from God. But now on the other side is the requirement for pure, unblemished righteousness. The requirement is nothing short of perfection. There's a gap here. It's a massive one. How do we bridge it? Well, what if I do some good? So some people, they get involved in philanthropy. They like to help others. But it never satisfies the requirement of a sacrifice. You see, blood is still required. Because doing good things can never erase the other things that you've done. You can't take back the debit here and the debit there from your account. We all owe a lot. And the Bible teaches us that there's a cost to everything. Nothing truly valuable is free, right? And forgiveness is incredibly valuable. It's the resetting of that ledger, wiping it clean. But the cost, like we talked about before, it's more than we could ever afford. That's why we find in 1 Corinthians 7.23 that we were bought for a price. And in 1 Timothy 2.6, that he gave himself as a ransom for all. And in 1 John 2.2, that he is the atoning sacrifice for our sins. And not only for our sins, but also for the sins of the whole world. And in Colossians 2.13-14, through 14, that God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins, having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us. He has taken it away nailing it to the cross. And that is how we know that Jesus has truly paid it all. And so now, when we look back at Isaiah 53, we can see that this is kind of like a movie trailer to the greatest story ever told. You see, Isaiah the prophet, he was dropping hints about the Messiah, the Savior to come, Jesus. The passage is actually describing his sacrifice in detail. And it makes it clear that the, only the greatest act of love and the most perfect sacrifice could ever close the gap in our ledgers. Isaiah 53 is the prophetic plan of God, laid out long before the Roman nails touched Jesus' wrists. You see, the suffering servant from Isaiah's vision is the Savior who walked the dusty roads of Jerusalem who embodied that prophecy with every step toward the cross of Calvary. Isaiah said that he would be despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering and familiar with pain. Well, Jesus is the one who bears our grief and carries our sorrows. He's the one who healed the sick and embraced the outcast, only to betray, be betrayed by a kiss and denied by a friend and abandoned by many who shouted, Hosanna, just days before. It was Jesus who in the Garden of Gethsemane faced the cup of suffering with a resolve that echoed Isaiah's prophecy, yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. You remember he said, if it's your will, Lord, that the cup should pass from me, but not my will, but your will be done. Remember that? The agony of that moment, it wasn't just physical. It was the burden of every sin, every mistake, that we've ever made being placed on his shoulders. And this was the turning point, the fulfillment of a divine strategy for redemption that Isaiah glimpsed centuries, seven centuries earlier. Isaiah speaks of the servant being pierced for our transgressions and crushed for our iniquities. On the cross, Jesus didn't just bear physical nails. He bore the weight of our brokenness and offered us a bridge back to God. But the story doesn't end at the cross. You see, Isaiah prophesies a victory beyond suffering, a reward beyond the pain. And he speaks of seeing light after the suffering of saving many. The empty tomb on Easter morning is God's undeniable statement that death doesn't have to have the final word. And our sins don't define our future. Amen? Jesus' resurrection 
is the ultimate demonstration of power over pain, of life over death. Our faith is built on the person of Jesus, the fulfillment of prophecy, the embodiment of love so amazing that it bridges the gap between a holy God and a broken humanity. Jesus' sacrifice offers hope, healing, and a new beginning. The story of Jesus prophesied by Isaiah and realized in the Gospels, it is history. And it's the power of God for salvation to everyone, everyone who believes. I want you to imagine with me for a moment what Jesus' journey to the cross was like. Imagine with me the gravity of the sacrifice. Jesus is in the Garden of Gethsemane, where the Son of God is confronted with the cup of suffering. He's about to drink. The weight of the world's sins, past, present, and future, is being placed upon his shoulders. Imagine the emotional turmoil, the dread, the anticipation of pain so severe that it causes him to sweat drops of blood. This is where the weight begins to press down on him. Now imagine being wrongly accused. You're standing in court where the jury is biased, the judge is corrupt, and the evidence is not true, but it's manipulated against you. That is the modern day setting for Jesus' trial. Despite his innocence, Jesus faced the ultimate miscarriage of justice. He stood silent, absorbing every false accusation, every unjust verdict, as if each lie was a heavy stone added to the weight that he already carried. It was a mockery of a trial. Jesus is beaten, spit upon, and he's mocked with a crown of thorns. Each thorn is a piercing reminder of the sin that he's bearing. Each mockery, a lash on his back. The physical agony is unimaginable. But it's also the emotional and spiritual agony that's even more crushing. He's carrying the weight of betrayal, of abandonment by his closest friends. And yet, he remains silent. Because he knows this is the path of redemption. Now imagine your most embarrassing moment. Your most embarrassing moment. Let's think about it. Broadcasted for the world to see. Your privacy is violated. Your dignity stripped away. Jesus was stripped and humiliated in front of a hostile crowd. A public spectacle. Spectacle designed to break his spirit. But even in the moment of utter vulnerability, he remained focused on the purpose of his pain. Think about the times that you felt discarded by those that you trusted most. Jesus experienced the same thing as his closest friends deserted him in his darkest hour. And in today's world, it's like being ghosted by everyone that you thought cared at the moment that you needed the most. Jesus still continued his journey. Isolated but unwavering. Propelled by a love so deep. That it's hard for us to comprehend. Consider the most physically exhausting and emotionally draining experience that you've ever endured. Jesus walked to the cross on Calvary. Was this. And infinitely more. Jesus, he's already battered and bruised. He's now carrying the crossbeam of his own execution through the streets. The weight of the wood was like the weight of our sins. And every step towards the cross was a proof to his commitment to carry through the mission of our salvation. The crowd that once cheered for him now jeers. What happens next is a moment that is about to define history, the crucifixion. As Jesus is nailed to the cross, 
Think about the gravity of that moment. Each hammer strike that's driving nails into wood, it's as if each blow is piercing through our own history of wrongdoing. But he takes it. Why? Because of a love so vast, so deep, it's willing to endure the ultimate sacrifice to ensure that not one of us is beyond redemption. Nails driven through his hands and feet, and Jesus is lifted up on the cross. This is the true weight of the world in its most literal sense. Every sin, every failure, every moment of shame, we place that on the cross. The Son of God. The physical pain is excruciating. But it's the spiritual separation from the Father. Something he had never known. That's the ultimate. There amidst the pain and the mockery, Jesus looks up. What does he see? Perhaps in his divine sight, he doesn't just see the faces of those around him. He sees you and me. He sees our struggles, our failures. But still he loves us. It's the ultimate sacrifice. Laying down one's life for friends. And even for those who don't know yet the love of Christ. But why endure such pain, such loneliness, such despair? Because that was the cost. A sacrifice was demanded. That's what it took to bridge the gap, to offer us a clean ledger, to provide forgiveness, to break all the chains. It was because a love that's unfathomable, unconditional. Jesus bore the weight of the world so we wouldn't have to. He faced the agony so we could know peace. He entered into darkness so we could live in light. And then those three words that changed everything came. It is finished. So with that declaration, Jesus didn't just announce the end of his earthly life. He was proclaiming the completion of a transaction. The debt that we could never pay on our own was paid in full. Not with gold or silver, but with something far more precious, the blood of Jesus. Think about what it means to have a debt paid in full. In our lives, when we pay off debt, there's just this sense of relief, of freedom. You could breathe a little easy. But knowing the reality of freedom from sin because of Jesus' atonement, nothing can compare. His sacrifice, it offers us a freedom that's not just for the here and now. It's eternal. It's a freedom from the chains of sin. A passport to a life lived in the light of his love and grace. Jesus said, it is finished. He made a way for us to have a relationship with him. A relationship that's marked by grace, not by, by our shortcomings. The price paid on the cross is both a declaration of love and a call to live in freedom that was bought for us. We got to think on, on this thing this week. In light of such an immense sacrifice, the natural question that arises is how do we respond? Let's take a moment for a personal reflection. I want you to think about the areas of your life that maybe you've been holding them back from God. There's nothing He doesn't already know. 
Maybe it's a habit, maybe it's a relationship, or even a part of your identity that you've been clinging to, believing it's too broken and too tarnished to bring to him. Now I want you to see yourself walking up to the foot of the cross, carrying these parts of your life in your hands. Visualize laying them down one by one at the foot of the cross. Jesus' sacrifice was not just for the sins of the world in a global sense. It was for each of us in our lives. What do you need to lay down? Laying down these burdens at the foot of the cross is just the beginning. Jesus didn't just die for us to free us from the penalty of sin. He rose again to give us the power to live in freedom every day. So first, let's talk about forgiveness. Forgiving those who have wronged us. It's not just a kindness. It's saying, because I am forgiven. Because I am forgiven, I choose to forgive. Start with one act of forgiveness this week. It might just be the key that unlocks a deeper freedom in your life. Next, breaking free from sin. This isn't about trying harder in our own strength. It's about living in the power of the Holy Spirit. Identify one area where you're struggling, and commit to bringing it before God daily, asking for his strength to overcome. He'll answer that prayer. Finally, let our lives be a reflection of his love and sacrifice. Whether it's through acts of kindness, sharing our story of faith, or simply living with integrity in our daily lives. Let's make the choice to honor him. Let's be the hands and feet of Jesus in a world that desperately, desperately needs it. I want to challenge you this week to take this step, just one step, inspired by the sacrifice that was made for you. And watch how that step can lead to a journey of freedom and purpose that you've never even imagined. With the shadow of the cross behind us, now we turn our faces towards the dawn. The resurrection is a historical event. And it's also the victory that seals our freedom. So next week as we step into part three, living in freedom, we'll dive into what it means to live in the light of the resurrection. The stone has been rolled away, and not just from Christ's tomb, but from every area of our lives that feels sealed, sealed off or dead at times. The same power that raised Jesus from the dead is at work in us, inviting us into a life that truly is alive in Him. We'll explore how the resurrection empowers us to overcome sin, to forgive freely, and to live with a hope that cannot be shaken. The resurrection is our declaration of victory, a promise that no situation is beyond His redeeming. I want to invite you in this moment, if you've trusted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, to participate in the Lord's Supper, communion with us. If you haven't already received the elements, there's a table in the back. You're welcome to lift your hand and someone will grab that for you and bring it to your seat. The Lord's Supper is when we remember the sacrifice that Jesus made for us. It's when we recognize that he gave everything to purchase us for a price. We read in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, 23 through 26, that the Lord Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, took bread. 
And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you, rep- you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. We thank you, Jesus. We thank you, Jesus. You were so good to us. You were so gracious. You gave your body, you gave your blood as a sacrifice. Let's bow our heads in a moment of surrender. In our hearts, let's invite Jesus into every part of our life. In this moment, Jesus, I invite you into my heart. This moment, with your sacrifice, with your blood. I stand in awe of your sacrifice. I'm humbled by the depths of your love, Jesus. love for us. When I think about your journey on the cross, I recognize the area of my own life that needs your healing touch. Father, today in this place, we choose to lay down our chains at the foot of the cross. We surrender our hurts, habits, hang-ups, all to you. The only one that could free us, the only one. With open hearts, Lord, we step into the freedom that you offer, the freedom that you bought with your precious blood. Help us to live in the reality of your resurrection. to embrace the life that you've called us to live, a life marked by your grace, your power, and your love. Father, may our lives be a testament to your transformative love. May they be a living celebration of life over death. We give you thanks and praise. For you are worthy, and your love endures forever.